Hi everybody, welcome to the Emory's Memories channel. I'm your announcer, Gary Beatty. This channel was created to feature interviews by Ralph Emory. There are over 125 interviews by Ralph for you to enjoy on this channel. This channel has also become a collection point for rare and in some cases never before seen shows and interviews. What you're about to see is one of 14 classic interviews hosted by the Lagarde Twins from Sydney, Australia. It's part of a TV series they created, and it's called Down Home, Down Under. Now, these interviews have remained in their private collection, and they've never aired on radio or television until now. And now, let's join the Lagarde Twins as they interview another great country star. Welcome back to Lagarde Twins Down Home, Down Under. Now here's my brother Tom to tell you about our very special guest. In 1977, Helen Cornelius and Jim Ed Brown became the most successful duo in country music history. That's right, Tom. After touring four strong years that featured sold-out crowds, hit after hit, and with rave reviews, she has become more successful than she ever dreamed. She is known and loved by all, our very special guest, Helen Cornelius. Good morning. Welcome to the show, Helen. Thank you. It's so Hi, good Helen, to see nice two to see of my favorite Aussies. Good. <laughs> <laughs> You've never been to Australia, have you? No, but I would love to. You know, I, I've looked a lot at the geography of the nation and just, you know, the mountainous, the hilly area, and it's very much like Hannibal, Missouri, where I grew up, you know, with with rivers and, you know, and real hilly, and, uh, and I would love to travel It's there. a pretty country. Where were you born in, uh, in Missouri? Well, actually in Hannibal, which is Mark Twain land on the Mississippi River, and I grew up with catfish and, you wow. know, and all those good things. The first song we ever learned back in the bush country of Australia was the Jimmy Rogers song about uh, the Mississippi River. Uh, so we, oh, really? we heard all about the Mississippi long before we... Uh, went to America. So you, were gro you, you grew up on a farm then? I grew up yeah. on a farm. I was the next to the youngest of eight children and a lot of people will say, well Helen, how does such a big voice come out of such a small person? I know, you have such but a beautiful voice. I, I think I had to holler to get anything, you know, to get <laughs> you, my turn. Did you have to milk cows? Did you have to milk cows? The know? cows didn't like me, Tom. They didn't? Uh, I did what you call strip them. <laughs> I didn't get any milk. They would kick like, please. <laughs> but you know about when they splash their tail around and hit you in the face? Slap you, know? you in the face with it and... You know, my brothers were always good at milking, you know, and hitting the cat in the face and stuff like that. But, but I would just try and try. But I, I guess my technique was all wrong. Helen, <laughs> how old were you when, when you, you had the desire to... How old were you when you really felt what you wanted to become and wanted to do in, with your life? You know, I'm glad you asked that question because a lot of people don't realize. Um, I think they think that, that we grow up and our... our formed by our parents and we are to a certain extent but you know in the eight children all of us were different I was the dreamer and when I was five years old and out on this farm and I we had a two-story old farmhouse and mm -hmm. and my window faced the south or I say mine mine and my two sisters and my sister always wet the bed on me every <laughs> night um, anyway, you had to sleep with I them? had to sleep with two of them and, uh, and the one wet the bed every night, so it didn't make a difference. Who does it? You all get wet. So, <laughs> so anyway, you know, we had a window that faced the south over the watermelon patch. And, uh, and I would sit there and look at the stars every night and just dream. And at that time, I dreamed of singing. But, but that, at that time, uh, Debbie Reynolds and Jane Powell were very, very big in musicals. Right. And I would look at Debbie Reynolds, and I think because she was small and it was very obvious I was not going to be very big, that I thought I was going to be just like Debbie Reynolds, and I was going to be acting and singing. And uh, that part of it actually came true in 84 when I toured as Annie Oakley in Annie Get Your Gun. Oh, wow, like, what yeah. an experience. So We, we met Howard Keel one time in, in Los oh, Angeles. Oh, no, really? He played Annie Get Your Gun on Broadway for about two years. Yeah. So you did a, a part in that, did you? I did. I had Annie Oakley and really? uh, we toured nationally for four months and we did, I think, like 75 performances in 50 major cities. And did you enjoy it? How, how oh, it? I loved it. I would love to do I would love to do the unsinkable Molly Brown. I think it would be a great character and they're both kind of feisty. 
uh, small characters who think they can lick the world. <laughs> well, you know, you, you have a, such a vivacious personality. You're always happy and smiling, and, and, and that's just uh, yeah. tremendous. Have you always had that an outgoing personality? Um, You're an extrovert, I imagine, right? Not really. Only when I am on stage, and yes. I think that I'm just so comfortable there, and mm -hmm. I'm doing what I love. The rest of the time, I'm really a very, very quiet person. Private. So very private, extremely private. I'm, I entertain myself quite well. I'm, I'm a big loner, but I read a lot and uh, deal with my music a lot. So I'm not entertained a whole lot by television. I don't watch a lot of it. I read a lot, but. Uh, but, you know, people see you on TV and they see you laughing and they say, oh, she must be that way all the time. But right. I'm really not. Like Holly Dunn, we had her on the program and she said, people don't understand that you work 23 hours to perform on stage for one hour. Right. Helen, when did you and Ed Brown get together and how did that whole event uh, evolve? I mean, Well, actually, Jim Ed had been on RCA Records for, um, I think, probably... Uh, 20, 18 years at that time. Mm -hmm. And I was a brand new artist on RCA Records, and they were getting ready to put a single out on me. In fact, it was going to be called We Still Sing Love Songs in Missouri that I wrote. Uh, when his producer, Bob Ferguson, found the song I Don't Want to Have to Marry You, he said, I know it's a number one record and it's a duet, and I want to record it with Jim Ed Brown, whom I had never met. Mm -hmm. And we met in the studio. For the first time. For the first time, recorded this song. He did not want to do it. He didn't like my voice really? at all. No, he didn't like my voice. And uh, what a shock he got! <laughs> yeah. And what a mistake it would have been had he not. Yeah. So it was a monster record, oh, you I know. know. What a... And uh, so we worked together for four years, and then we split and went our own separate ways. And last year, you know, we did 20 concerts together, and I kid on stage and tell him, you know. He didn't like my voice at first, but boy, before I came back the second time, I made him beg. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good for you, Helen. It's like my wife tells me, she said, uh, you know, Tom, she said, y you've got a beautiful voice if it ever reaches your throat. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? <laughs> uh, so uh, you teamed up with Jim Ed. Right. And are you still uh, touring uh, together, Well, Helen? not really together, but I have my show, my unit, and I work... Mm -hmm probably 95% of the time is a solo act, mm -hmm. and he has his. The buyers mm -hmm. have the option of buying us together. So if they want to book the show, the Jim Ed Brown, Helen Cornelius show, mm -hmm. they can do that. And my entourage pulls up, and his entourage pulls up, and then we do a duet show, which is, which is entirely different than our individual shows. Right, right. So you have to remember now uh, what comes next, because it's different. But yeah, we do. Hey, Helen, I went out to the mailbox one day and uh, picked up some mail, and this little booklet was in there, uh, far beneath the bit of snows. I saw Helen Cornelius, and I thought, you know, we had done a show together right. a few years back, and I started reading it, and I want to tell you, it brought a bunch of tears to my eyes because nobody, until they've experienced death in the family, can relate to what a heart-rendering thing it is. It just pulls your heartstrings, pulls your whole guts out, you know. And um, the story, uh, w would you share with us, um, if it's not uh, too emotional? Well, um, my son Joey um, was in junior bull riding, um, and it was something I was very much against, and, and I would not sign the papers to allow him to ride. Uh, so his father did, you know, because fathers are into things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was... He was killed by a bull in the rodeo, and... Um, How old was he? Joey was 19. How old was he w when he decided to get into the rodeo business? Uh, just 18. 18? Mm -hmm. he, was, he wasn't really into the rodeo business. It was just like a, whenever he could, could <clears throat> do it, you know. And I, you know, it was, uh, it was the most difficult thing I think anyone could experience in life. You know, we lose our parents. Right. which is inevitable, and most of the time they've lived a long, full life. That's right. and, and people lose spouses in death, and most often they, they have a wonderful memory, but they remarry. But a child is part of your flesh and blood, and That's right. it's just part of you, and a part of you dies. And I truthfully did, did not want to live. I really didn't. I, but even though, and that sounds cruel because I had two living children, and I didn't want to be separated then, but you have such an intense 
intense longing to be with what you lost. And if I were not a Christian, uh, I don't know how I could have made it through it, really. Hel Helen, we have to take a, a break right okay. now. But we want to, when we come back, we'd like to resume that story because it's such a, okay. uh, a very touching thing. And uh, so we're, we've been talking with our special guest, Helen Cornelius. And so don't go away because we're going to be right back and we'll, we'll carry on with the story about the death of her 19-year-old son. We're talking with our very special guest, Helen Cornelius. Helen, uh, as Tom was uh, mentioning before, we, we'd like to continue on the theme mm -hmm. because, you know, we rodeoed professionally, too, yes. for two years. We can relate a, a little bit uh, to your son because... To the danger of it. To the danger yes. of it. You know, yes. it's like, man, what chances men have against... And also the, the excitement that lures you to that, which is something, if you're not a rodeo rider, you don't understand that. But, but I know that someone like you all would, because Joey used to say to me... Uh, Mom, you just don't understand. I love doing it. And, and he was killed on a Saturday and on a Wednesday, and I always worked on weekends. And, and on a Saturday, Joey was rodeoing, and it was at Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, which was two hours from Nashville. Mm -hmm. And he said, Mom, please come and see me ride. And I said, I said Son, I, I, I had a premonition. I said, I know you're going to get killed. And I said, I just cannot. Did you say those words? Yes. And I said, I cannot bear to see you hurt. I said, Joey, if a bull threw you, I, I don't know what I would do. What happened? Did he get caught in the... In the uh... It actually um, threw him and then the bull gored him. It threw him in the air and everything. What about didn't, quite... they have the, didn't they have the... the, cl they the clowns? They did have the clowns, but what actually yeah. killed Joey was the, um, the bull stepped on his heart and his heart was bruised and started. You know, you it's know, a funny thing too, Helen, about when uh, you have to face it because death is a final thing and you, you have to overcome it. And you mentioned a little while ago that your strong faith and belief uh, was the thing that uh, helped you through. So... Uh, well, you... Um, if you don't know that there's a hereafter and you know that you're going to be rejoined, um, I can talk yes. about it until still I talk about how it happened, but... I, I like two, to share. Yes, I have two other children, yes, have two other children? children and, I, and I like to share for the simple fact that, that I think if it gives other people hope, that That's that right. is important. And, right. and I always knew, and, and I'll never forget, I had a uh, maid at the time who was so sweet, and she said, honey, she said, Joey's debts are paid on earth. And she said, you and I still have to pay our debts every day of our life. So as we go through tough and rough days, I think... She knew what she was talking about. Absolutely. We still go through the, the pain daily, but Joey's, Joey's whatever, his purpose on life was fulfilled. And, and I am just, since people say, were you angry at God? Never. He I has the right, Helen, to take away and to give. Well, I was so fortunate to have been blessed with that special yes. gift for the time uh -huh. that I had him. And he uplifted my life and he uplifted so many people's lives. And uh, so I know that, that I will see Joey again. And... Uh, so I know you will, that's and my salvation. this song, every time you sing it, just remember in the winter, far beneath the bitter snows, so, lies a seed that with the sun's, sun's love, love in the spring becomes a rose. So and when I sing that song in that rose, I see Joy's face. What's on the, what's on the front burner for um, Helen Cornelius? Well, I just recorded with Paul Overstreet, and he's oh, a wow. wonder. Not only is he a hit RCA artist himself, he's a wonderful producer, writer, mm -hmm. and... Uh, I am, uh, we're shopping for a deal right now, and we've also looked at the possibility of my husband opening a music theater in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, mm -hmm. which is on the coast, and of course, uh, a lot of uh, tourism goes, goes through there. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, to isn't where it? I, oh, it's That's wonderful. On the, on the Atlantic coast, right? And I'm a natural beach bum. Oh. Well, you, so. you'd love uh, Surface Paradise the, in Queensland, the state where Ted and I are from. Yes. It's very, it reminds us very much of, of Myrtle Beach. Oh, if I can just have, be near the water. That brings me such a peaceful state of mind, you know. So, so we've talked about that, and I'm still touring and, you know, just uh, riding around that big bus Singing Enjoy country it. music. But you, you, love, you love the business, yes, I uh, do. Helen, I do. and uh, we hope that it won't be long before the people in Australia will get to see you down under. I we, hope. We want to let you know that it's been a real joy having you, you on Down Home, Down Under. What a great classic one-on-one -on -one interview with Ted and Tom, the Lagarde twins. I want to tell you about their book, 
the Lagarde twins, showbiz hustlers. Let me take you back to the beginning. These twin boys walk 15 miles across the bushlands of Australia to a tent with a dirt floor and folding chairs. As the projector started up, the movie appeared in black and white on the screen. And there, for the first time, they saw Hopalong Cassidy. They ran almost all the way home and told their mom, we're going to become cowboy singers. Let me read the introduction to Showbiz Hustlers. Being raised in the bushlands of Australia in the 1930s and 40s was a rough and hard life. We didn't think about it back then because that's how life was. You have to live the hard life to understand it. But we also made a picture in our minds of the kind of life we wanted to lead, and it became a beacon that has guided us on our long journey in show business. We hope and pray that our book falls into the hands of our fellow strugglers and dreamers to give them unfailing encouragement to pursue their hopes and dreams. Above all else, we want to give God all the praise and glory for our long lives and for His mercy and grace in dealing with us throughout the years. So grab the reins and ride over one million miles with us from the bushlands of Australia across seven continents through 23 countries and 45 of the 50 states in America. Let's ride. Ted and Tom Lagarde. They appeared in Vegas, movies and TV shows. And for you Trekkies out there, get this. This book is packed with pictures and stories and is a must read. We'll put a link below the video so you can get your copy of The Lagarde Twins Showbiz Hustlers. The Lagarde Twins Showbiz Hustlers makes a great gift. This book is about twin brothers from Australia who had a dream and it came true. This is Gary Beatty and as Ted and Tom Lagarde would say, Good day, mate.